reading today is from Acts chapter 4 verses 5 through 12. The next day the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Cephas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick 
and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Here ends the first reading. For the fourth Sunday of Easter, the psalm is the familiar Psalm 23. The 23rd Psalm is one of the most requested by people in times of stress when they seek God's comfort. Let's read it together, all of us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading today is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 24. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. Thanks be to God. Hear this reading from the 10th chapter of John. 
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lie, lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, <clears throat> because I lie down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lie it down on my own accord. I have power to lie it down. And I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the gospel of our Lord. So first, let's <clears throat> look at a little theological tidbit that we, we don't often look at. In this gospel of John, this 10th chapter, it lays down this idea that Jesus is actually the one that is handing himself over to be crucified. And we don't think of it that often, that way that often, because we are used to the <clears throat> Judas betraying him, Judas turning him over. But ultimately for the Gospel of John, Jesus is the one that ultimately not only turns himself over, but dies. Jesus is God incarnate. He could have stayed up on that cross all day, every day. But it's through his giving up his spirit, making that choice, that the crucifixion is completed and then the resurrection can happen. Slow tidbit. But we're going to continue our testifying, our witnessing sermon series. I was thinking about logos the other day we have church logos the ELCA has logos ministries have logos I am actually getting a pastoral logo done for some side things that I am doing there's company logos there's sports team logos there. There's logos. Logos are constantly around us. And even when logos are just slightly tweaked, we can recognize the company they are at least trying to imitate. Those logos witness to the company. Those logos witness maybe even to certain values that the company promotes. Um, Coca-Cola. I want to give the world a Coca-Cola, right? And, you know, unity and happiness and, you know, joy, good times, wholesome, good, happy people. When you th see that red, you may not think that consciously, but that's, what subconsciously has been implanted when you see that logo. And we could go on and on, right? Like maybe when you see the Apple logo, you might, if you're an Apple person like I am, you may think quality, you may think stability, whatever. If you're not an Apple person, you may see it as a high-priced piece of technology that is outdated. You may see a sports team logo. And if it's your team, it, it incites love and excitement and enthusiasm. If it's not your team, it may incite anger, dislike. Because especially if they're your rival. 
logos testify and witness to the company and to what that company hopes you think of as far as good things. And again, we have Peter testifying in Jerusalem to the high priests, to those in power, to the rulers of people and elders. He's testifying to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Peter is testifying. I posed a lot of questions about testifying last week, of witnessing. And again, I want us to think about that. When we wear our cross jewelry or our shirts with Bible passages or um, a cross on it or when we're driving in the car and we have Bethany Lutheran Church or St. Paul's Lutheran Church on it or a cross or one of the Christian fishes or whatever symbol or logo of the church, what are we testifying to? What are we witnessing to? And that's a really hard question, right? Especially if we're driving. And if you're driving in, let's say, downtown Baltimore or having to deal with traffic on the Washington Beltway and someone cuts you off, having that cross may be a little bit sticky. I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I'm driving and I have my pastoral collar on, it stops me from reacting the way that I kind of want to react, right? It gives me that split second of thinking, oh Lord, I, okay, collect yourself, Greg. Or when we're driving down the road, when we come to an intersection, maybe I'm the only one that does this. I'm probably the only one as far as most people are concerned, but if I have my pastoral collar on and I'm just in one of those moods and I see someone with a sign and I don't have money or a snack, I'm ashamed to admit this, that sometimes that collar gets removed and that top button gets unbuttoned because that, that, that collar, that tab, is a symbol. In many ways, it elicits the same reaction as a logo, right? We know what to expect when we see these things. So the question is, again, much like last week, what are we witnessing to? And how are we witnessing to that? Is the message that we want to be, be proclaiming, lining up with what we are actually testifying to and witnessing through, to, through our words, actions, and deeds? Or is there a disconnect? That's the trouble with logos, right? Or with symbols. Let's say, let's go back to our computer logos. If you're a Windows person, a PC person, you see the little Windows icon. And you may overlook some of the challenges that often come with using Microsoft products. If you're a non-PC person and you see that Windows logo, that Microsoft logo, you might quickly want to run the other way. Because for you, the negative is brought up, <clears throat> is in the forefront. And that's certainly not the messaging that Microsoft wants to be projecting. That's why you see companies being relatively quick to respond when there has been an issue. They don't want to mess up their branding of quality. 
of a quality product of certain values. I wonder if we do the same thing as a church. Do we own up to when the church has failed? Or do we try to brush it aside, pretend it doesn't happen, and by doing so, for those that are done with the church, remember I mentioned the duns last week, for those that are done with the church, it's now those things that become so much more important. And it's those things that are highlighted because those things are tangible, can be looked at, can be acknowledged, instead of the things that we think we may, as the church, the body of Christ, be projecting, be witnessing to, be testifying to. Again, these are hard things to think about. What Are, are we really testifying, witnessing to the welcome that Jesus gives all people through communion, through the table? Are we excluding some? Are we really witnessing to God's presence here in this time and in this place with all of us? For God so loved the world, all of creation, all of humanity. Are we witnessing to that? Or are we testifying to something else when we have our cross shirts on or our church logos or whatever? Is the messaging lining up? Are we testifying? Are we preaching? Are we proclaiming the risen Lord, the risen Lord that raised from the dead out of love? I think that's a self-reflection question. It's also a reflection question we must ask as a congregation regardless of what congregation you're at. We must ask these questions. What is our witness? What is our testimony? Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of Intercession Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving Shepherd, you know your own and your own know you. Your voice calls us to your loving embrace. Strengthen your church throughout the world that we bear witness to your expansive love. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Gracious Shepherd, you are generous with the gifts of goodness and mercy. Restore your creation to wholeness so that cities and towns, countryside and wilderness may abound with life. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Hope-giving shepherd, the nations and peoples are your heritage. Place into the heart of all leaders and rulers the passion to serve. Crucify any desire to overpower others and give leaders joy in lifting up the lowly. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding Shepherd, your love flows as we reach out to those around us. Move us with your spirit so that we lay down our lives for those in need, especially those we name now. Help us love one another in truth and action. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Saving Shepherd, you restore us to wholeness. Help our community in our life together and give us vigor as a people of faith. In the midst of challenges and opportunities, fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal Shepherd, you hold us securely in your loving hands. In the assurance of resurrection, hope, we remember our loved ones who have died in you, especially the evangelist Mark. Bring us with them to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God.